The Collector's reign over the Boiling Isles reaches a breaking point as Emperor Bellows returns to the Demon Realm to put an end to everyone once and for all, while Luz and friends face off against Kiki Mora one last time. Luz's Palisman, Hunter Flapjack Powers, The Collector's Backstory, Another Grimwalker, and so much more. I'm Ostrich Vox, and this is the Roundtable's breakdown of the Owl House Season 3, Episode 2, For the Future. Running through the episode for all the details you may have missed, and all the exciting moments I know we're all amped to talk about. It's the middle of the end, and things couldn't be crazier. Strap yourselves in, because the hype train is going off the rails. Also, I know we usually have the fan spotlight in our big episode breakdowns, but because of how this episode leaked weeks ahead of premiere, it's a little dicey to open submissions as they're usually built around the episode itself, so here's what we're gonna do. Later this week, I'm gonna put out a proper review of the two specials, and the fan spotlight will be in there. So be sure to submit your fan art and tag us at RoundtableVids on Twitter and other perspective to the final moments of King's Tide, as we see that the Collector tore the top of the Titan's skull apart, right down the middle. After Luz and friends were forced out of the Demon Realm by King, Luz swiftly opened and closed the door a few times, trying to get back to the Boiling Isles. Well, we see from the other side that the portal didn't just run out of juice or anything, which was my assumption. It straight up exploded into a million portal pieces. Which might explain why the gang's attempt to power the same door with their palisman had such an adverse reaction. Aside from the lack of Titan's blood, they were trying to connect to basically nothing. Just a bunch of broken parts. The Collector whisks King to his side as he celebrates his newfound freedom, unleashing a storm of colorful constellations that terrorizes the Boiling Isles. I feel so terrible for all these people. First, their leader tries to wipe them out, and then like a half hour later, they have a different Armageddon in the form of an all-powerful child. Worst weekend ever. The Collector wants to know what this Owl House game King has up his sleeve really is. And sure enough, it's something a lot of people expected. A role-playing game where they reenact the many adventures Luz, King, and Ida have been on since Luz first arrived in the Demon Realm. Lilith, armed with Hootie, attempts to confront the Collector and get King to safety. I love that when old Hootsifer is a backpack, he can act as a little Hootie-copter. It's creative, and it got a good laugh out of me. After being in prison for over hundreds of years, the Collector is very overprotective of King, his proclaimed best friend, and he won't stand for the two being separated so easily. Going on the offense, Collector launches a crescent moon at Lily and Hootie, transforming them into puppets, sending them off into a castle in the sky, formed out of the top of the Titan's skull and the architecture inside of it. This has to freak King out, man. You find out you're literally living on your dead father, and now you're living in a castle that's made out of your dad? I don't know, that's too much, man. Toy transmutation is a trope you'd surprisingly run into more than you'd think, especially in anime, including including the Pokemon anime. Why is this worth mentioning? Because I'm overconfident in the idea that if the Owl House team likes a property and the show does something similar to that property, then it must be intentional. I've said in other videos leading up to this special that the collector's story reminds me a lot of Pokemon Movie 3, where a young girl named Molly loses her parents to the elusive unknown, who transforms her house into a giant tower, where she holds Ash's mom captive against her will. Molly's living in denial, using the power of the unknown to bend reality to her liking, struggling to come to terms with the notion that her parents are gone. I definitely still get a lot of those vibes throughout the episode, but the collector turning everyone into puppets reminded me of an episode of the Pokemon Indigo League anime, where a trainer named Sabrina had the ability to turn people into creepy dolls. It's regarded as one of the scarier episodes of the series, just for how unsettling everything is. I definitely think the collector could be drawing some inspiration from both Sabrina and Molly. Rain wakes up in Ida's care during the mayhem, surrounded by the collapsed coven heads. Ida is now one-handed, as Rain chopped off her arm to spare her from the draining spell in King's Tie. As we hear a fantastic reprise of Rain's Rhapsody, Ida shifts gears into Harpy mode and pursues the Collector, who spreads their magic all throughout the Isles. We see through a pentagram feed that civilians are starting to be seized by the Collector's underlings. Blue stars with piercing black and red eyes, zapping them into toys and transporting them into the castle. The Titan's carcass is flooded with a sea of magic. All right, look, no shade at all. But we all recognize the pattern these Disney TVA shows have with their final arts, right? The main setting gets a wicked facelift as the villain's domain looms above everyone and they have their own specialized minions patrol the land to capture beloved side characters. 
characters. And it's up to the main characters to find a way into said domain for a final confrontation so they can save their friends, save their families, and save the world. Gravity Falls did it, Amphibia did it, and now the Owl House is completing the trilogy. It's not like a bad thing by any stretch of the imagination, but when I saw those giant blue stars, I laughed just because those are just Bill's eye bats, turning people into toys instead of stone. But it's not like a bajillion video games don't also do something like this, so it's more of a pattern in storytelling that's led over to animation. Before Ida can reach King and the Collector, her curse begins to flare up and restrain her from moving forward. This is the first time we've seen Ida affected by her curse while in her harpy form but it may be a result of the draining spell causing the curse to flare up. Ida tries to use the last of her elixir, but is halted by the Collector, whose delivery of this next line gave me chills. You look fun! Wanna play? Ooh, cold! As Ida lunges at the Collector, the Owl House logo is coated with a pink tint, with the emblem of Albert reflecting that of the Collector as it's half gold, half blue. I love it! After changing the logo for these first two specials, you gotta wonder what it's gonna look like for the final one. Maybe green with a hint of blue to represent Bellos? Or maybe silver to rep King? These are the things I think about at 2am, eating out of a bag of shredded cheese. Luce wakes up in the in-between realm once more, as she's approached by a mysterious golden figure, eager to grab her attention. A little zoom and enhance, and you have what's undoubtedly a titan. Now it is from a distance, so he's not the most rendered fellow, and it kinda looks like he has dad clothes on, but that just may be from a lack of detail. Still, we know if any titan reached out to Luce in a mysterious realm in between planes of existence, it would more than likely be King's father, the Titan of the Boiling Isles. There's been moments all over the series that hinted at the Titan guiding Luce as she slowly masters glyph magic. Now he seems to be approaching her at a pivotal moment for Earth and the Demon Realm, as the fate of which kind and humanity for being real hangs in the balance. What does he need to tell Luce or give Luce? Maybe he could show her a super powerful, super secret glyph, or a way to defeat the Collector while minimizing damage. We'll find out in the final special, but I can't wait to see this thread finally pay off. I also wouldn't be surprised if the in-between realm is some sort of purgatory for titans and maybe even collectors. It would explain why King, once linked to the Collector, ended up here in dreams, connecting to his ancestors like an avatar state. But why is Luce linked to this realm? Was her ending up here in yesterday's lie really the result of a fluke portal? Or is she one of the only few people who has access to this realm, given that no one else got pulled here when going through the portal? So many questions, so little time. Amity recovers Luce, who tries to explain what she just saw, but instead tries to ask about he who should not be named. Hunter calls out Luce, trying to avoid saying Bellus' name, claiming that, unlike Voldemort, a swarm of ghosts won't appear if you say his name. Probably. Harry Potter reference aside, this could be alluding towards Bellos seeing the dead throughout this episode, but it could also be a nod towards the final battle of the series. Would you be surprised if Bellos commanded a swarm of ghosts to his side? Because at this point, nothing about that man surprises me. Also, we better see Camilla swing at him with a baseball bat, covered in glyphs. Returning to Bonesboro, the gang is caught off guard by its, uh, whimsical appearance? And Camila is alarmed by the giant skull. Who knows if that monster is alive or not? Yeah, I definitely think that thing's coming to life. Luz confides to her mom that she still plans on staying in the human realm after everything's said and done. Although Camila is clearly trying to be supportive of her daughter spending time in this world, despite how much it scares her. I love the fact that you've been living on a giant... Carcass. Elsewhere, Bellos is decomposing and on the brink of death, his rotting body melting away as he continues his wild hallucinations. Haunted by his brother, whose soul is apparently trapped as a model sheet? That was a joke. But look at his line art compared to literally any other character. What? It just looks like they dragged in a Photoshop file. Which isn't an insult. Everything in this episode looks great. Also, we got some blood with that dagger. Got me yelling at the TV. Bellos places the responsibility of his terrible actions onto Caleb, refusing to own up to his actions, insinuating that if Caleb never fell in love with Evelyn, none of this would have ever happened. I'm sorry, thinking a baddie corrupted your brother's soul or whatever is the most beta shit I've ever heard. Bellows the type of fellow to roll across the floor and shout, Cooties! Because a goth girl brushed against his arm. Don't let this man enter a hot topic, or like, 
scroll through TikTok. Luz returns to the Owl House for the first time since the Emperor's Coven raid back in Season 2. Still abandoned and barren. Remember, they didn't just raid it in an attempt to arrest Ida, King, and Luce, but they also confiscated almost all of their belongings. Where's my boy John Luke? Willow gets a lot of focus in this episode, built around her tendency to keep her feelings bottled up, and how those feelings tend to seep out through her latent power. As shown when Camila tries to get Willow to open up, only for Willow to deny that there's anything bothering her. But the trail of plants rising up from the floor tell a different story. Willow believes she always has to be the level-headed, mature, and reliable friend of the group. She can't be vulnerable because she thinks she can only be the shoulder to cry on, and never the one crying. One thing this episode does with Willow to convey her nearing the breaking point is how often she's drawn with stress lines under her eyes. It's a good way to convey emotion and show us how she's really feeling, even if she claims the opposite. Amity finds a loose in Ida's nest, surrounded by like lifts, calling back to the end of the intruder back in season one. Luz hopes laying in this nest of her palisman will help it hatch, but Amity reminds her of what the Bat Queen said back in season two's hunting palisman. Kneel and state your deepest wish, and your like-minded partner will find you. Connecting to your palisman requires expressing your deepest wish. For Amity and Ghost, Amity was forced to be honest and recognize that although her future is unclear, she knows she wants to choose that path herself rather than doing whatever her parents tell her to do. Knowing this, I imagine it hit really hard for Amity when Luz asked her out, given that she said, I have no idea what my future holds, but it would be so cool if you were in it. Hunter believes he saw Ida and King, leading to everyone chasing them down to the town square, where they stumble upon a handful of puppets and the collector's disturbing game of Owl House. A reenactment of the Intruder episode, with Terra Snapdragon taking the place of Ida. How'd she make it this far without getting Toys R Us? Camila's first time on a staff also mirrors Luz his first time. I think that was a pretty neat detail, even though she looks horrified. This scene really helped me understand the Collector's thematic connection to King. Collector is like if King never grew as a character, but had all of the power that King sought after. They're both the last of their kind, and as a result, they both longed for companionship. But whereas King eventually crossed paths with Ida and later on Luce, people who had his best interests at heart and wouldn't be afraid to ground him in reality, the Collector had Bellows. Someone who never had his best interests at heart and had no problem telling the Collector whatever they wanted to hear in order to get whatever he wanted from them. King is the only one who's really in the position to talk to the Collector and steer them in the right direction. But sadly, it won't be easy. The group decides they have to make it to the castle before Bellows can reach the Collector. But they're sidetracked by the arrival of Matholomew, Barkus, and Skara, who all seem to have really arced out. We learn that after the events of Labyrinth Runners, Hexide prepared for the Day of Unity and planned to lay low. But unfortunately, everyone with a sigil was still impacted by the Draining Spell. Once they were able to recover, the Collector's all-seeing stars swarmed the place thereafter, capturing numerous teachers and students, including Principal Bump and Basha's crew. I love how when they're entering Hexide, the giant piece of wood reads, No non-puppets allowed. But whoever painted this also made it a point to say that they love the Collector. Just got a good chuckle out of me. Hexide has become what I can only describe as the kids next door, mixed with Lord of the Flies. Kids are running amok, eating stale moldy bread and fruit. There's a market with booths that sell novelty t-shirts and bootleg candy. It's absolutely wild. They even made a statue in memory of Principal Bump. Which gives me dabbing Ann vibes. Viney tells Willow that her orchids have become sentient and waged war against kindergartners. Which, although played as a joke, is another example of Willow's bottled up emotions manifesting into powerful plant magic. Amby has a heartwarming reunion with her siblings, although Edric has seen better days. Notice how Emra's acne is visible and Edric is wearing his glasses. Because in this apocalyptic times, they seem to have lost their concealment stones. They probably traded it for food over at the market. We also learned that Matholomew's name is actually Matt Tholomew, as in, Tholomew is his last name. This episode is blowing my mind. Meanwhile, Bellows has returned to the Skull of the Titan, using a secret underground entrance that takes him to the Golden Guard graveyard, where he sees the sight of Caleb and numerous Golden Guards haunting him varying in height and hair. One of these golden guards actually appears to be the one that was seen helping Bellows in Hollow Mine, instructed by his master to burn down a village. Entering his Grimwalker laboratory, which has a dagger lodged into a book, Bellows finds one more Grimwalker cooking in the oven. 
possessing it without second thought. King and the Collector return to the castle, where they're greeted by... <sighs> Oh, Dahlia, how'd she make it this far without getting Toys R Us? Oh, Dahlia tries to sway the Collector to use his powers for something closer to her liking, suggesting to remake the Boiling Isles to something that would definitely be in her image. But Collector swiftly shuts it down and demands her to make more pizza bagels! Moving to the Collector in King's bedroom, which was beautifully painted by the artist, I gotta give my kudos. We find that their beds lay on a tiny planet, which features its own gravitational pull, Reminds me a lot of King Kai's planet from Dragon Ball, which is also a small little planet that more or less operates the same way. Don't know if it was intentional, but it's cool to see. As the Collector gets ready for bed, he summons a gigantic book comprised out of stone tablets, requesting a bedtime story from King. Oh, this child is so lost. These tablets finally give us some highly anticipated lore on the Collectors. The excerpt King reads states, Collectors live long, we watch things pass. To preserve to observe, we must amass. What flies, what swims, be it predator or prey, seal them up so they may never fade. But should they meddle in our affairs, we'll clean the planet and scorch the air. So collectors were a species of all-powerful celestial beings who seemed to be near immortal, if not just live for a very, very long time, far longer than humans or witches. It sounds like collectors dedicate their lives to, well, collecting. Collecting different forms of life that they find interesting in order to preserve them for eternity. A species can't die out if they're preserved by the collectors. And because life is finite, every race and species is valuable to the collectors. If we look back at the show's past, it's very likely they collect in different ways, with different abilities. The collector that captured the Owl Beast probably isn't the collector we've been dealing with. Not only were they a lot taller, but they collected by turning life forms into scrolls instead of puppets. I wonder what all the other abilities the collectors have. Could they turn someone into a Funko Pop? An Amiibo? Uh, uh, NFT? Now that would be scary. But should anyone stand in the way of the Collectors, the Celestial Beings will eradicate them all from existence, which happened with the Titans, who presumably weren't okay with any of their people being turned into a scroll or a toy. This is where our Collector seems to be different from the others, as he looks at their history with great shame, altering the text to say that it's better to make friends, and that playing together is way better than war. And you know what? He's right. He actually wrote this revision over an illustration of an unknown race making an offer to the Collectors. Although these are depicted as orbs, they could be stand-ins for anything, really. It could be wildlife, it could be pets, it could even be children. There's a lot of dark implications at play, and it seems like the Titans were really the first ones to stand their ground and fight for their freedom against the Collectors. The Collector wants to sleep with Francois, but King is hesitant and reminds Collector that Luz is the only other person allowed to touch him, which clearly upsets the Collector, who's formed a grudge against Luz without even getting to know her. He's clearly afraid that Luz will steal King from him, ruining the friendship they have. The Collector needs to learn that people can have more than one friend, or even a best friend, and that it's okay for him to open up to more than one person as well. That's right, the solution's gonna be friendship, but at least Bellows will have a gruesome death, probably. Back at Hexide, we learn that Basha has become president of New Hexide, going on a power trip, as she has definitely not Kikimura whispering into her ear. I won't lie, Mickey definitely had me fooled for a good minute, but it was easy to figure out what was really going on the more she kept talking. Talking. The fake backstory really gave it away. My little sister and I found ourselves hiding here after the uh, incident. Basha and Mickey reject Luce's help, but luckily, she has an idea. As King traverses the halls of the castle, he passes by portraits that depict the Collector's backstory, similar to how we learned Bellas' backstory in Hollow Mind. The origins of the Collector seem to date back to the Big Bang, as the right side of the hallway, or the left, if you want to look at it from King's perspective, is all portraits of an explosion, the planets, the sun, and the moon. For those who don't know, the Big Bang is a physical theory that explains how the universe expanded from the initial state of high density and temperature to the array of planets and stars that we have now. Kikimura referred to the Collector as a child of the stars, and that seems to be literal. He and the rest of the Collectors were the direct result of the Big Bang, which 
kind of makes sense. If this event created planets suitable for life, especially in the Owl House's universe, why wouldn't it also create actual life that embodies the cosmos themselves? These portraits also imply that the sun and the moon are actually alive, as the sun is illustrated with a face complete with two eyes, while the moon is illustrated with a single eye. Given that the Collector's face appears to be half of the sun and half of the moon, I'm getting the vibe that Collectors could be born from the two colliding. Some sort of eclipse. So his true parents, if anything, would be the literal sun and moon. Our Collector was definitely born at a later point from the rest, given that he's depicted as small and purple instead of tall and blue. The Collectors eventually set their sights on the Demon Realm. Unlike other planets that let the Collectors walk all over them, taking whatever they want from whoever they want, the Titans of the Demon Realm weren't going to stand for any of it, waging war against the Collectors to disastrous results. At some point during this war, Collectors inadvertently formed the Titan Trappers, as we see three of them don the skulls of Titans, which to me says they were going to collect from this planet, whether the Titans were dead or alive. Brutal! As the war raged on for an indiscriminate amount of time, our collector came into the fray, but instead of wanting to fight, he just wanted to play with all the little titans. A relatively peaceful collector who was surrounded by nothing but death, destruction, and absolutely terrible influences. This is why the collector is so playful and innocent, yet destructive and careless. It's hard for him to differentiate harmless playing from lethal battle, which is how you get fun games like Tag. As time passed, the Collectors and the Titans drove themselves into extinction, with only King and our Collector left. The Collector getting sealed away by King's father in order to protect King, who was hidden away on an island far from the Boiling Isles. What an intense backstory for such a little guy! King bumps into Odalia and requests to have Hootie in his possession, before finding Ida amongst the Covenhead's collection, who simply wanted to pay Rain a visit. God, they're so in love! I want them to be happy! The first thing you'll notice about Ida is that she has a new hairdo, with much shorter hair. It's a return to form given that she had this look when she first found King, as seen in Echoes of the Past. It's also kind of a role reversal. Back then, Ida had to look after King, but now, King has to look after Ida. And honestly, this has me terrified. Not that she isn't rocking it, Ida can rock just about anything. But it's undeniable that this haircut matches up with the silhouette of Caleb's lover, Evelyn. Considering Bellos is on his last legs, and can barely tell apart reality from his memory, already mistaking Luce for Evelyn, he's almost guaranteed to mistake Ida for Evelyn in the finale. And I don't think his response is going to be anything but violent. Ida and Lilith have been laying low since the Collector took over, as the Collector believes Ida is still transformed as the Owl Beast. As for Lilith, clearly King convinced Collector to free her at some point, but we're really lacking the specifics on how that happened. We also learn that the puppets retain a little bit of sentience, as Hootie is able to recognize and communicate with Lilith, which has some dark implications for Rain later in the episode. Matholomew reveals that he's been plotting in the photo lab, leading to one of the coolest callbacks of season 1, as the photo memories from Understanding Willow make a return, using the magic pliers to find the memory of Bellus's transportation glyph that transported him in and out of the Titan's skull. Speaking of Bellos, his attempt to hijack a Grimwalker of Caleb goes awry, as the body isn't stable just yet. We see the flesh of the Grimwalker melt away as Bello struggles to maintain the form before he abandons it entirely. Assuming the body will be ready in the finale, it looks like we'll be getting Hunter vs. Hunter after all. But going off script for a sec, could the reason why this Grimwalker's falling apart have something to do with the fake Selkie Damas scales that would have been delivered to Bellos? Because if you remember, in the season 2 premiere, Ida and Luz staged the Selkie Damas slaying. Selkie Damas scales is one of the ingredients for a Grimwalker. So if Bellos doesn't have the real deal, it makes sense why this body wouldn't be ready, aside from not having enough time to cook in the oven. Decomposing faster than before, Bellos makes a mad dash for the castle, almost giving us the sweet release of Odalia's death, but instead, the Emperor decides to shatter my heart into a million pieces by hijacking Rain's body. I kid you not, this was so out of left field for me that I literally screamed at the TV. After finding the memory they need, Willow hands Hunter a photo of him with Flapjack. This overwhelms Hunter with emotion, which throws Willow off guard. Instead of making him happy, she was met with melancholy. Gus confesses to Hunter that he already knew he was a Grimwalker ever since reading Bellos' mind. 
but he was waiting for Hunter to talk about it when he was ready. Now he's questioning if waiting was the best move. Yeah, Gus, you did the right thing, but you probably should have said something on Earth. You guys had, like, three months. It could have came up. Basha corners Willow into a trap, which leads to Mickey revealing herself as... <gasps> Kiki Mora? I totally didn't expect that at all. Wow. The Owl House sure is full of surprises. I don't know if I like Basha or Kikimura being in their villain era this deep in the series. Honestly, it just felt like they needed to end this episode in a certain place. And this is how they decided to pad out the time. Kind of held back on an otherwise fantastic episode for me. But if you're a fan of Basha or a fan of Kikimura, I'm sure those exist. Then you are probably happy. Bane approaches the collector's bedroom with a green scar forming on their cheek, mode covering their ear, and Bellow Scoop oozing from their eye. This has me terrified! We know that when Bellows possesses a life form, he's eating away at that host to sustain himself, killing them slowly. That's why Hunter was covered in brand new scars after Bellows ditched his body. Bellows was eating his body alive. This same horrifying thing is happening to Rain's body while Bellows is in control. So someone needs to catch onto the act and get him out of there fast, before there's nothing left of Rain to save. Bane attempts to possess the Collector in their sleep, presumably trying to take over so they can use the Collector's all-powerful magic to wipe away which kind in one fell swoop. But the Collector catches on to this disturbing presence and questions why a puppet was brought to life without his involvement, in which Bellows BSs his way into living another day. Side note, Rain's hair falls forward here in the exact same way that Dana drew them a while ago, which I speculated would be their look in this episode. And I was kinda right, just a little off the mark on the details. Hikimura throws Luce, Amity, Camila, and Metholomew into a pit, where she goes in for the kill. Camila tries to go for an ice glyph, but instead makes more of an ice grenade. Not a bad first attempt. I definitely think they're paving the way for her to cover her baseball bat in Glyph's next episode, bringing everything full circle. Basha pleads for Amity to come back to the Mean Girl Squad, desperate to have her back by her side, but Amity obviously declines. You know, there's a whole apocalypse scenario she's gotta worry about instead. Amity and Matholomew will pull an old switcheroo, using the same illusion trick that Gus uses which Hunter and Luce's appearance back in Clouds on the Horizon. Amity makes one more plea to Basha for their freedom, but before we get an answer, it's time to switch scenes. Now, I don't know about you guys, but I HATE the misunderstanding trope, and I was shook to see it be the catalyst to the final conflict of the series here, as Bane courses the Collector into spying on King causing Collector to hear just enough to make it sound like King's gonna pull a classic George and Lenny. Tell me about the Stone Sleepers, King. When in reality, King just plans on talking things out. You really couldn't have the Collector keep the speakerphone on for a few more seconds? Really? Once again, we see that the Collector feels genuine remorse for the eradication of the Titan as he reacts with a deep sadness when King references the event. I think that remorse, that piece of his consciousness, will be pivotal in turning the tides and winning him back over in the finale. We also learn that Titans can nullify Collector's magic with their own powers, so we may see King forced into a situation where he has to fight the Collector in order to save everyone. Which honestly might be a little upsetting to watch, because I genuinely like the Collector when he's not being a menace from hell. Camila and Luz have a heartwarming moment together, where Camila shares all the time she's felt like she's messed up, apologizing to Luz for not standing up for her at the start of the series, trying to protect Luz from the trouble she faced by making her conform to the norm. But she recognizes this was wrong. She loves her daughter for who she is, and she should have just let her be herself. This apology helps Luz come to terms with her own baggage, her own internal conflicts, as she realizes that all she ever wanted was to be understood. She thought that no one understood her in Gracefield, even her own mother. So she ran away to the demon realm, surrounded by people who did understand her. But thanks to Bellos' manipulation, she was left feeling like she was responsible for the pain and suffering of those who connected with her. But now, through this journey to stop Bellos once and for all, and through this conversation with her mother, Luz finally recognizes that she is understood by her mom, and that making mistakes is just a part of life. She isn't someone who weighs everyone else down. She's a beautiful soul, a shining light that pierces through the darkness. And with this epiphany, Luce's palisman finally hatches, initially taking the form of a sparkling purple orb. Meanwhile, Willow is struggling to be vulnerable with herself and her friends, causing Gus and Hunter to get wrapped up in her plant magic. 
But as she begins to succumb to her own negative thoughts, entrapped in her own magic, Hunter activates a parting gift from Flapjack. The Palisman's magic, bringing the Naruto reference full circle. Hunter fans rejoice! Hunter confesses that Willow and the rest of his friends mean the world to him. He just wasn't ready to say it. Gus encourages Willow to let out everything she's been holding in, releasing her magic as a result. It's healthy to talk about your emotions. Who knew? The gang converges and faces off against Kikimura together before the Hexide kids pull up to the scene, revealing that Basha decided to do the right thing after all. The Hexide kids distract Kikimura, while Luce and friends form the spell glyph, with the reprise of the Amity vs. Hunter theme in the background that had me moving and grooving. An absolute bop! Shout out to Brad Breek! Everyone arrives to the Skull of the Titan, where Luce's palisman finally evolves into its true form. Is it a bird? Is it a snake? Is it a bat? The answer is... All of the above! But it's primarily a snake. It's a snake shifter! Yeah, we were right. No big deal. All in a day's work. Just kidding, like, everyone figured that out. But yeah! Meet String Bean, everyone! Loose's dope-ass palisman! Hunt low fans around the world scream at the top of their lungs as the two hold hands. Or, uh, fingies. But everything isn't all peaches and gravy, as the Collector and Bane watch from above. Luce's presence ticking off the Collector so much that he says it's time for a new game. His eyes glowing red as he snaps his fingers, bringing the penultimate episode of the series to a close. We get a lot of cool illustrations in the credits that give us some context to a few things in the episode. Basha and Matholomew butting heads over how to run Hexide prior to Kikimoro's arrival. The Collector and King having a tea party with the puppified Covenheads. Darius Everwolf hanging there. And probably the most important, King hugging Ida in her Albeast form with Lilith's puppet right next to them. The Collector watching from a distance with a look of concern on his face. He recognized King Sorrow in this moment and presumably decided to free Lilith from the nightmare that is being a living doll, while also deciding to spare Ida. Basha went into hiding after the Collector's all-seeing stars arrived, comforted by Kikimura, who managed to sneak her way in amongst all the chaos. We see that Ida decided to give Lilith her new haircut, although King's unsure of her approach. But hey, Lily's a redhead again! And we see King reflect on the past, as he longs for his old life with Luce, Ida, and Hootie, knowing that even if they get out of this, nothing will ever be the same again. Last but not least, we have the Collector floating outside of the Titan's skull. Which, I don't know, the ominous music makes me think he might try to do something with it. There's only one episode left, and things are intense. What's going to happen to the Boiling Isles? Luce, King, Ida, Amity, Gus, Willow, Hunter, Rain, and all the others. Are we going to see Bellows kick the bucket? Brutally? God, I hope so. We're officially in the endgame, and I can't wait to break down the final episode of all of you in a few months' time. But for now, I want to know what you guys thought about this episode. What are your thoughts? Where do you see things going for the finale? We got plenty of Owl House content on the horizon around this second special, so please be sure to subscribe to the Roundtable with notifications on so you never miss a video. And be sure to follow us at Vox and at Roundtable Vids on both Twitter and Instagram. If you enjoyed this video, please be sure to like. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you all in the endgame. See ya!